You're welcome. It's Sunday the 14th of February. A um, bit of a general update on the US and the UK today, and then we'll just see how we go. I haven't quite decided what I'm going to do yet. So, um, But let's start off with um, the current data from the United States and the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Now, we see this, this great fall in cases in the United States and the number of new cases and the UK, Canada likewise. But of course, Australia and New Zealand have done somewhat better um, all the way through. So certainly good to see those 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 reductions. But let, let's just uh, give it give a few real numbers there. Put a bit of meat on those bones. So United States cases have gone up by about 100,000 in the last 24 hours. Now, this is still this is still pretty high. Um, the numbers have gone down. Let's just look at the uh, the screen from the states there. So the numbers have gone down, but they're still pretty high. You know, we've still got fairly high seven day moving average there. 104,000 new cases per day. So this has not gone away. And in the United States, particularly, the, the death rate is remaining. We won't give feedback just yet. Thank you, CDC. Uh, the death rate is remaining really quite high. I mean, it is starting to drop off and it will drop off. But the lag is, I must say, the lag is longer than I had expected. So um, a lot of people still dying in the States. Let, let's just review those figures. So um, 27 million uh, official cases. Deaths, well, over 3,500 deaths in the last 24 hours. This is still high, 474,000 deaths. We knew weeks ago that we would be over 500,000 deaths, over half a million deaths. And this current figure, 474,000, is 0.14% of the population, the entire population of the United States. Now, the reason I put that in is we're going to be comparing uh, probably today or tomorrow, we'll see how we go, but comparing just what uh, proportions of populations have been lost specifically to, to COVID-19 during this pandemic. Hospitalisation in the States... Again, going down, but this is still a high figure. It's basically 70,000 people still hospitalised with COVID-19 in the States. Uh, that's the number 14,369 in intensive care. That's the number still being ventilated. So trends are good, but still, still very much uh, a current problem. Vaccine doses since the 14th of December, when the programme started, over 50 million. So the first dose, uh, 37 million booster doses over 13 million but again just re-emphasizing how far we still have to go we still haven't uh, vaccinated or the the authorities in the state still haven't given a second dose of vaccine which is their policy to five percent of the population yet um, there is still a long way to go on the vaccination program uh, but now the trends are good. Past seven days, um, new daily reported cases down 22.1%. 20, Great. New daily reported deaths start, just starting to go down, as we saw on that graphic there. Just starting to go down now. The, the, the deaths will go down now. There is no question about that. They're going to go down. We know that because the numbers have been going down for a, a week or, or a few weeks now so the deaths will go down but there's been a long tail of deaths but of course they are going to still keep going up to well over the half million mark unfortunately in the states um so new daily reported deaths 5.8 down 5.8 percent covid related hospitalizations still relatively high but down 17.8 percent test positivity rate well under half what it was 5.8 percent so when it gets below five percent that will be below the epidemic threshold but it's not quite there not quite there yet the trends are good i'm still worried and i will be for some time about the possibility of the new variants in the states so um COVID-19 cases caused by variants in the States. Now, th this is this is a new dashboard here from this uh, Helix company, but it's not very good. They haven't updated it for a while. I think it might just be due to lack of data, but we'll be looking at the CDC site as well. But in terms of B117, the UK variant, the order is Florida, California, Georgia, Texas, in that order of number of cases. Now, the... Level of genomic surveillance in the states is still not is still not good, 
But let's have a look at this screen here, which gives us some more information. Now, this is live time from the uh, US COVID-19 cases caused by variants live from the CDC. So the variants they're worried about, the UK variant, the South Africa variant, and this one's one of what's called the Brazilian variant. So it's the UK South African and Brazilian in, in that order. And we see we haven't got complete data, but uh, what we've got is 981 UK, 13 South African and three Brazilian variant. And the one I must say I'm most concerned about from what I know about at the moment is this South Africa variant. I really do hope everywhere can keep that out. So again, live time data, um, very good, the CDC website. So Florida, we see B117 variant, the UK variant, 347 cases, uh, Brazilian zero, and um, thankfully, that's good, uh, South African zero as well. California's next. I think Georgia was uh, about the third, yeah. So um, interesting to go around, look at your state, look at states you're interested in. And... Uh, that, 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 that's the most up-to-date lifetime data that we have on that. So that's just a brief review of what's happening in the United States. Very good trends. Um, looking brilliant, but there again, we were November, December in the UK. So I'm still concerned. Now, the vaccinations are picking up in the States, but not quick enough to generate the herd immunity. So... I expect cases to keep going down in the state, down in the states, unless this variant, because these variants become a significant issue. And and to be quite honest, how that's going to go at the moment, I don't think anyone really knows. It could go either way. The longer it goes on, uh, uh, the more hopeful I get. But remember, the US has not yet vaccinated five percent of its population, so that just puts it in perspective. And the, the, the need for the ongoing precautions at the moment is is absolutely tantamount at the moment for the next for the next few weeks. I really hope this message is is really taken on board in the states. Um, now, moving on to the UK, um, UK data. So, um, number of cases. Uh, that was Saturday, that was Friday. Data is always a bit difficult for uh, the weekends. Well over 4 million official cases now. Deaths again, that was Saturday's numbers. Always lowered it in the weekend, so I'm afraid that's artificially low. That's probably nearer the real number there for Friday. Um, 117,000 deaths now in the UK. And we noticed that 0.18% of the population of the UK um, has died. And remember the number in the States was 0 0.14. These are just according to my calculations, but I, I don't see why they're not accurate. So 0.14% of the population in the United States has died of COVID. Uh, 0.18 uh, in the UK. So the UK death rate per capita is higher than that in the United States. Um, now, the government's pleased with itself about the vaccination. It's very pleased with itself about the vaccination programme. And I share that. Um, I still think it could have been done quite a bit quicker. I can think of a few ways to speed it up. But um, it is it is delayed by um, quite a bit of um, bureaucracy and administrative issues. Um, I still feel that giving vac large doses of vo larger volumes of vaccines out to more localized areas could have speeded this up quite a bit. But we are where we are at. We have to go with the program. And um, 14 and a half million first doses, second dose, which of course we're not focusing on, but we'll have to start soon as the time gap gets bigger. Just over half a million doses. So plenty of uh, information there, tracker app and other things if you want to click on them from the UK. But all I'm going to highlight from the UK at the moment is uh, Mr. David Davis, MP, um, who kindly did give me, he gave me a ring actually, I was quite pleased a couple of days ago, um, excuse me for the name dropping, uh, <laughs> to talk about this new uh, Spanish study, which he reports on here. So I did the video on this yesterday. So uh, this is a very important study on vitamin D and COVID-19. Its findings are incredibly clear. An 80% reduction in the need for intensive care and a 60% reduction in deaths simply by giving a very cheap and very safe therapy, calcifidiol 
or activated vitamin D, so writes uh, tweets David Davis. And we looked at this in detail yesterday, and of course we completely concur on this channel with this thinking. Uh, the findings of this large well-conducted study should result in this therapy being administered to every COVID patient in every hospital in the temperate latitudes. Um, I did say yesterday that if regulatory authorities like, like NICE and uh, the regulatory authorities around, around the world don't look at this new convincing data that we, we looked at fairly extensively yesterday, they are really derelict in their duty of care. They really have to do this. If not, to be quite honest, there are serious questions to answer. Even if they to review it, thoroughly review it, and then say, well, we've thoroughly reviewed this, but we reject it because. Not that I can see any reason why they should reject it. Uh, me and David Davis certainly agree on, on this one. Um, and here, here we have... Um, furthermore, since the study demonstrated that the that the clear relationship between vitamin D and COVID mortality is causal. The UK government should increase the dose and availability of free vitamin D to all the available vulnerable groups. So I, I agree, of course, completely. And uh, we did look yesterday that there's a very strong predictive element uh, in this data for, from Barcelona, from Spain as well, in that people that are admitted with higher levels of vitamin D already did better. People that were admitted with low levels of vitamin D did not do so well. In other words, low levels of vitamin D were a bad prognostic indicator. So uh, I, agree with, I agree with Mr. Davis. I, I think the case is made and it really is, um, should be with the authorities now to look at that. Uh, now, Oxford University extends COVID-19 study to children. So Oxford vaccine group, COVID vaccine trial published on the 13th of February is being done in London, Southampton and Bristol to look at the safe, safe, safety and immune response in children and younger adults ages 6 to 17 years. Now I'll tell you what I expect. Uh, I expect it to be demonstrated to be safe in children and I also expect it to be demonstrated efficacious in children at about the same level as it was in adults and indeed in older people contrary to what some European countries are still in, in still curiously insisting that this vaccine is not suitable for the over 65s, which it patently is. What, what, why is this not being rectified yet by the German authorities and I think the French authorities? Very strange that they haven't uh, rectified that yet and started rolling out the Oxford vaccine to the over 65s. Anyway, I'm expecting it to be efficacious in children as well. Now, it's a single blind. In other words, the people giving the injection know the people receiving the injection don't know. Randomised phase two trial, 300 volunteers, 240 going to get the vaccine, 60 going to get the, 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 in the control group. Now, notice the control group. And this is quite clever, really. The control group is not, the, is not um, salty water. It is an alternative vaccine, which will also give a sore arm. So I'm afraid the children and the parents will have no idea whether they've been given the meningitis vaccine, which is the control, which won't, which we know is not effective against COVID-19, but is known to be safe. Um, they won't know the difference. It's safe, but it will still give a sore arm. Now, this just shows to me how seriously the Oxford group are taking the placebo effect. Now, with the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, as far as I'm aware, um, the, the placebo or, or the control group were just given placebo. They were given salty water. And Although it is, I can't work out any possible mechanism why a placebo effect should affect immunity. We know placebo effects uh, affect everything. So it makes a lot of sense that they are doing this. Uh, Andrew Pollard, professor, also a paediatrician himself, of course, infection and immunity, chief investigator at the Oxford vaccine trial. So while most children are relatively unaffected by coronavirus, um, and are unlikely to become unwell with the infection, it is important to establish the safety and immune response to the vaccine in children and young people as some children may benefit from vaccination. Well, some children may indeed uh, benefit from vaccination, Professor. Absolutely true, I agree with you 100%. And I would also add that I think you and me both know that we need children to be vaccinated to establish herd immunity which uh, you didn't mention, uh, at least I couldn't see you mention it. <laughs> but I mean, obviously everyone knows. Yeah, yes, it can uh, it benefit individual children. 
but sooner or later children are going to be have to be vaccinated otherwise the disease could be self-propagating in children and herd immunity would not be achieved so this is going to be essential for herd immunity and i agree i'm not taking that away it is important for some children i agree completely these new trials will extend our understanding of the control of uh, SARS coronavirus to younger age groups. So, yeah, he is talking about it there, really, isn't he? And, uh, the, the, I mean, and, and Professor Andrew Pollard, he really is um, one of the main brains uh, of, of this. One of um, se several uh, of the lead investigators. And starting trials for younger children, also Pfizer, Moderna and Janssen, are going to be starting in spring. So, uh, so that's good and and basically it's going to be essential now it's a sunday today so i was gonna, gonna i've got some other things i could tell you but i think what we'll do is um what one of the things i feel it's important is is i mean we've looked at the big picture there but i also think it's important to look at the the individual experience so um we're, we're going to listen to to nick's individual experience nick, nick gives a very thorough account if you're not interested in individual experiences, that's fine. Leave now. If you are, then I think you'll find uh, Nick's um, uh, very clear explanation very interesting. As uh, I really feel it's important to really think about the the, the experience on individuals, and uh, probably more on that later. But but l l l l not not later in this video. <laughs> later generally. Uh, there's so much, so much we could do that. I mean, the, you, you, you sometimes think, what am I going to talk about tomorrow? And there's always so many things you could talk about. Um, so I'm, I'm going to keep a couple of things for tomorrow. But let, let's uh, let's see if Nick will speak to us now. Hi, hey John, and to all your followers. Boom. AstraZeneca jab done and in my left arm. Had it done this morning. Um, at about 10 a.m. Um, I had it done at home by the home, the roving home team as I'm clinically extremely vulnerable. Um, I have a form of muscular myotonic dystrophy um, which puts me at risk through my swallowing uh, in that I would be uh, at high risk of not being able to take a ventilation tube um, and various other issues around um, drugs that they would use to keep you uh, asleep um, could potentially cause malignant hyperthermia for me. So yes, I'm clinically vulnerable. I'm not really at any more risk of getting a more severe case than anyone else particularly. It's just that if I did get a severe case, I would almost certainly be having to be put into palliative care uh, rather than potentially ventilated if required. Okay, so the jab was done this morning. Um, as I say, 10 o'clock. It's a couple of hours past that now. The um, reason why I didn't record it being done um, is purely because I am a big needle phobe um, and I would not have been able to film myself getting it done because I know that within 10, well, I'm not say 10 seconds, but within a minute of having an injection, I normally pass out. And today was absolutely no different. Um, <clears throat> the staff were wonderful to... Um, to uh, district nurses came to the door um all masked up um obviously the syringe was drawn and ready i asked them not to show me anything um i made my way into the living room uh they stayed in the hallway i got my arm present and available for them looked away and they came in jabbed it i wasn't even aware that they were doing the injection um i couldn't be sure whether the feeling i was feeling was the alcohol swab going on or the injection needle going in or the vaccine going in it was all completely painless and over within under five seconds um but my body still decides to have a reaction um uh, which is the same to anything it could just be um sticking a caret in my ear to try and pull wax out i'll have the same reaction and that is i get bradycardic and i pass out um i always had my legs up ready for it i was expecting it to happen and sure enough it did um and probably in the next two or three hours after that i passed out another two or three times um but now feeling much more human again um my heart rate goes down to 32 33 beats per minute um and it makes me feel like i'm dying um 
so it's not really a needle phobia I have. It's a phobia against this reaction that I get, um, which is somewhat genetic, as I believe that m my dad has had this reaction a bit in the past as well. Um, so um, right now, how do I feel? Uh, apart from feeling a little bit wiped out from passing out so many times, I feel absolutely fine. Um, I have a slight slight soreness and tenderness in the arm where it was done. feels like I was punched there maybe. Um but I know my basal temperature, uh, which normally is 36.4, and it is today. Um, I measured it just after the injection. Um, and I will do so again at 12 hours and at 24 hours and report back both times um, and let you guys know exactly what I'm feeling, if anything at all. I hope I do feel a little bit from it. Um, I've been taking 5,000 IU of vitamin D for the last... Uh, well, last over seven or eight months, really. Uh, I was taking 2,000 IU before that. Um, and, yeah, I'm hoping to get some form of uh, reactogenicity to the virus, uh, to, sorry, to the injection, um, uh, as as it, as it my immune system mounts a good response to it, I hope. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I shall report back in 12 hours' time. Um, until then, thank you very much. Okay, so it's um, 10 p.m., which uh, makes it 12 hours past my AstraZeneca first initial dose uh, vaccine for COVID-19. Um, yeah, I started to uh, I was starting to become aware at around nine hour mark that uh, I was getting slightly hot feet, um, slightly clammy, sweaty hands, um, and becoming aware of the smell of my BO, um, which is normally a sign that I'm c coming down with an infection. Um, I believe is a sign of, of your mem of your B cells uh, starting to do their work. Um, so I decided to check my temperature, and it was uh, thirty seven point four. So it was uh, definitely up from earlier, um, from my base basal rate of thirty six point four. So not high. Um, certainly nothing that requires any kind of intervention of antipyretics, um, but uh, a degree warmer than normal and uh, slightly noticeable, but certainly not uncomfortable. Um, no need to feel like I need to go and sit out in, out in the snow or anything like that. Um, not that we have a lot of snow down on the south coast. Um, but still, it was a temperature nonetheless. Uh, at 12 hour mark, which is now, I'm down at 37.1, um, which is good. Um, again, still don't feel any sickness from this at all. Um, I feel completely recovered. Well, as recovered I am going to be until I've had a night's sleep. Uh, from my fainting syncope episodes earlier this morning. Um, yeah, my heart rate's now sitting steady at uh, 60, between 55 and 60, which is where it normally is, uh, which is good. Um, and the pain in my arm, I would say, is around about 3 out of 10 sort of level. So nothing too serious there, and certainly nothing that requires any painkillers. Um, it doesn't feel sort of achy. I have no achy joints or achy limbs other than my usual kind of aches and pains. Um, so, yeah, um, still really happy to have taken the AstraZeneca jab. Um, not Obviously, there is slight concerns over the, the new variants um, and how they may if impinge on its uh, efficacy to stop me from becoming mildly ill. But if it stops me from potentially being hospitalized or dying uh, then i am all for it uh so yeah i shall be back in 12 hours after a good night's sleep um at the 24 hour mark and uh let you all know how i feel thank you very much hi so it's now 24 hours post the astrazeneca covid19 injection and i'm happy to say my temperature is now back down to its normal um 36.4 degrees celsius um and i feel absolutely normal um the only thing i have is slight arm pain um feels very much similar to when you're back at school and you had those pens with the four different colors and the little round sort of knobbly bit on top and someone smacks you in the top of the arm with one of them it's exactly what it feels like um again no need for any kind of painkillers um I've had no sort of need to feel like I need to skip any food. Um, yeah, I feel absolutely fine. In fact, I feel great. I feel really happy that I've had the, the first injection done. Um, so, yeah, um, anyone that's perhaps hesitant 
um, for getting uh, a vaccine um, because you're maybe needle phobic or you have a reaction like I do. Um, there is, it's easy for me to say there really is no no reason to be. Um, you obviously have your reasons in the same way that I have my reasons that I'm nervous and scared uh, for having a vaccine and obviously this long build up from realising that there is a virus emerging to oh my god I'm going to have to have a needle in however many months a year's time you know it doesn't help so there are ways of dealing with this um, um, one of them is to take control of the situation um, whether that be if the nurse asks to see your left arm and you say no nope, I want it in my right um, you may be right handed and that may be a, a bad choice but you know, if that's the control you need to be able to con feel that you have control over the situation, then great. Um, you can also tell the nurses and the staff involved that you aren't scared of needles. Um, they're used to seeing it and warn them if you're going to pass out that you may well pass out. Um, so that A, you don't scare them um, because sometimes it can be a bit nerve wracking for a, a member of staff who hasn't perhaps seen it before um, for to have someone collapse on them. Um but yeah, let them know that you, you're you're nervous of needles. Um, you don't have to suffer that in silence. It's uh, something which is not something to be embarrassed about. It's quite it's quite normal. Um, as I say not everyone will pass out. In fact, very minimal people do pass out from needles. Um, but again, there are ways. If you know that you are going to pass out, get yourself in a position where your legs are raised above your head before that happens, because that way it can help you uh, to mitigate the feelings that was the such severe feelings before you pass out of, of your blood pressure dropping and and the blood draining out of your head um so if you're already on the floor um a you can't fall down and hurt yourself um and sort of end up smacking your head on something which could end up putting you in a and e um and b you won't get that bad 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 feeling of your life drift, drifting away from you um you're just be aware that you are going to pass out and the next thing you'll know you'll be very confused on the floor coming round. um hopefully that will be it um but if you need you need to take some rest after that you need to sit down and chill drink some water slowly that will help re raise your blood pressure um and yeah just keep an eye on how you're feeling if you're feeling wobbly leave it another 20 minutes you don't need to get up and move around yet um there's nothing to force you to have to get up and move um so yeah um, and in terms of the process for me and, and getting my, my vaccination, I understand there's lots of uh, people out there that necessarily still haven't been contacted yet and are on the clinically extremely vulnerable list. Um, contact your GP at first port of call. Don't tell them that you're asking. You know, Start off with, with your, your contact saying, I'm not looking for a date um because that's going to upset them straight away um so just tell them you know you understand the situation uh, but you want to confirm that you're on the clinically extremely vulnerable list you've had the shielding letters but you haven't heard from anyone yet in regards to your, to your vaccine they are happy to tell you that yes you are on the cv list or no you're not perhaps you need to be we'll put you on the right list so for me i got a phone call a couple of weeks ago from from the lo from the local team to say that i was on the um at home list uh, but they couldn't offer me a date at that time. And then a few weeks later, I got a phone call on, on uh, I think, a Wednesday to say, do I want to come in and have it uh, at a vaccine centre? Um, and they, they then corrected themselves. So, oh, I'm sorry, you're on the, on, on the local home, home list. So I'm sorry about that. So there was a little clerical error there. Uh, but just goes to show that you can literally be co cropping up on a few lists. Um, and uh, then I think on the Sunday, I got a phone call um, to say, they will be around in the next couple of days to come and do the jab um and that was literally not even 24 hours before they turned up at the door uh, so they can't guarantee to give you a time and date uh, but if you're home um, then that's not a problem anyway um and uh yeah that was it uh, they've left me a letter they've left me a pamphlet which tells you like everything that's contained within the, the vaccine so you don't have to worry about that um they, I, they haven't left me of a date as to what date they're going to contact me again. But today I got the letter from the NHS officially inviting me for my vaccine, offering me to go to a vaccine centre or to a GP's or to ignore the letter if I've already had the vaccine, um, which obviously I have. So I should ignore the letter. And it states in the letter that they will be contacting me in due course about my second shot, uh, which I believe will be the AstraZeneca because obviously the trials between the different shots 
would have only just taken place and started. So, um, yeah, I, I assume I'll be getting a second AstraZeneca shot. And at that point, I will come back and explain how that went um, and uh, let you guys know if uh, there's any greater effect to the second uh, shot. Um, I'm perhaps expecting there to be a slight increase. Um, anecdotally, um, what's been noticed from a lot of my family who work within the NHS and are involved in the vaccine rollout is they're seeing a lot of the same uh, side effect profiles uh, of the AstraZeneca as they are from the Pfizer with people who have been previously infected with COVID-19 and have the antibodies to it. So that they are getting greater side effects from the AstraZeneca jab if they've had COVID. Um, again, nothing serious, nothing that, you know, perhaps you might get a temperature of up to, you know, 39, 40 for a few hours, maybe, um, maybe a banging headache for a couple of days maximum. Um, but that's it. That's, that's it. Nothing more. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to mention is that since I've been taking this higher amount of vitamin D, um, the, the 5,000 IU, which I do can take with a small amount of a hundred milligrams of, um, vitamin K2 and also um, calcium um, because I don't eat uh, dairy um, and, and I need to make sure my calcium level is good. Um, so I've been taking 5,000 IU a day uh, for at least the last eight months and up until last, up until I've started doing that, I've been suffering from something called Raynards which is where your hands get extremely cold and painful and numb and tingly and hot and red um, when it's remotely cold to freezing um, and it becomes crippling. Um, I noticed this year I was walking in the snow and I had my, well not walking in the snow, I was just moving around in the garden and I noticed I didn't have my gloves on and my hands weren't hurting. Um, so do we put this down to vitamin D? Um, do we put this down to perhaps it's just improved over time anyway um, I don't know um, but all I do know is it's an immune the logical response um, which is probably brought about by a heavy dose of a viral throat infection that I had a few years back um, and now I'm just not getting it um, so you know is it causation don't know correlation for sure um, just a, just a little thing I found out and I've noticed um, through this pandemic and um, through taking extra vitamin D that has helped me uh, perhaps in other part areas of my life as well without realising. Um, okay, so thank you very much, everyone. I'm sorry if I may have rambled a little bit too long, uh, but I really hope this has covered some areas of interest for people because um, there will be lots of people out there who are vaccine um, phobic um, or just medical uh, phobic in general. Um, you need to find a way that you can allow yourself to get your vaccine done and um, if it means you're not going to go to stand in a, in a vaccine center and get it done and you have to get it done at your gp so that's fine you may have to wait a few weeks longer to do so um but you know we're all still in the same process together until we're all vaccinated and done so you waiting an extra few weeks to have it done is not going to speed up or or, or um, Will delay your process of, of getting back to normal life because as we know once we've had the vaccine we are still in this same boat we are not out of it yet um so good luck to everyone else uh, everyone stay safe and well big thank you to, to dr john as always um keeping us all sane um helping us deal with this pandemic in whatever way we can um you providing uh, safe and acceptable knowledge um, and science which is backed up by evidence um is a comfort to me and I'm sure a comfort to all of your followers um, and has been from the very beginning because uh, no doubt no doubt of a lie that um, if I said at the very beginning of this I wasn't scared um, then yeah I was, I was lying I was I was I was petrified for the first few weeks and it, my way of dealing with it was just li literally to learn about the human body about viruses about vaccines um, and about how this can be improved um, and your channel um, and some of the other channels um, around YouTube have helped dramatically with that. Um, and following Dr. John's um, previous work on immunology uh, and the immune system and other cardiac systems, etc., has been fantastic. So thank you so much. And again, speak to you in 12 weeks' time. Bye bye. Hey, John. And. Mm. Oh, well, thanks for that, Nick. Um... Interesting. Um, we look forward to hearing from you in, in 12 weeks' time and uh, thank you for watching, of course.